أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلا حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله لا إله إلا الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد Dear Muslims, we all know that our Prophet وسلم, has told us and experience has taught us and basic psychology teaches us that your friends influence you. The people you hang around will shape who you are. Well then, if your friend can influence you, what impact do you think your life partner will have on you? If a mere friendship might positively or negatively influence you, what impact do you think your life partner will have on you? If a mere friendship might positively or negatively influence you, then what do you think the lifelong partnership and the companionship of a spouse will have on your entirety of this life and perhaps even the next life? It is because of this that the importance of a righteous spouse and the importance of a salih or saliha to be your life partner is something that the Quran and the Sunnah stress from beginning to end. In fact, Allah reminds us in a very powerful descriptive verse in Surah An-Nur. Al-Khabithatu lil-Khabithin wal-Khabithuna lil-Khabithat wal-Tayyibatu lil-Tayyibin wal-Tayyibuna lil-Tayyibat This is the general rule. Al-Khabithat Wicked and filthy women are for wicked and filthy men. And wicked and filthy men are for wicked and filthy women. And pure and righteous women are for pure and righteous men. And pure and righteous men are for pure and righteous women. 
This is the way things ought to be. This is the general rule. Birds of a feather flock together. So your life partner is an extension of who you are. The one whom you choose to live with and the one whom you actually live with should be representative of who you are. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden for Muslim men or women to marry polytheistic men or women. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَنْكُحُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنْ Do not marry a mushrika lady, O men. Do not marry a mushrika lady until they have iman. وَلَا أَمَةٌ مُؤْمِنَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن مُشْرِكَةٍ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ A ama, a slave lady, that is believing in Allah. You might think socially she's not to your level. You might think the socio-economic stratus is too much. Allah says a believing lady who is an ama is better and purer for you than a mushrika, a polytheistic lady, even if her beauty bedazzles you. Even if you think she is very good for you, the fact that she is a mushrika means you are not allowed to marry her. And then Allah goes on, وَلَا تُنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنُوا and do not marry your women to mushrik, to polytheistic men, until they believe. Allah says, even a man who is an abd, but a believer in Allah, is better for you than a mushrik, even if the mushrik bedazzles you. Even if you think he has wealth, he has power, he has status, since he doesn't have iman, he is not worthy for your women. And Allah then says, أُولَٰئِكَ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى النَّارِ these are going to influence and call you to the fire of hell. Notice, simply by marrying such a partner, the potential to influence you will be so great that you might end up on the path towards Jahannam. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden marriage to a mushrik or a mushrika. And the Quran and the Sunnah and the Seerah and the lives of the Sahaba and human history is full of examples of righteous couples and examples of the opposite. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the Prophet Zakariya in the Quran. And Allah Azza wa Jal praises Zakariya's wife. And Allah says about the both, both of them, listen to this, Innahum, the two of them, Kanu yusari'una fil khayrat. They would race one another to do good deeds. They would help one another, they would push one another to do good deeds. Yusari'una fil khayrat means the two of them are in healthy competition. They are team partners and they're helping one another to do good deeds. Wayad'unana and the both of them would make dua to us and worship us and pray us to us. Raghaban wa rahaba out of loyalty and out of desiring what we have and out of a fear of punishment from ours. And Allah says, and to us they were all submitting. So Allah praises the couple, Zakariya and his wife. And Allah says the both of them would help one another. The both of them were on this race together. The both of them would pray together, worship together, make dua together. And this shows us the ideal couple. And that is, they're helping one another on the race towards Jannah. They're competing with one another, not against one another. Each one is gently pushing the other forward. They're on the same team, wanting to help the other out. And that is what our Prophet ﷺ described. May Allah have mercy on that wife who wakes up for tahajjud and then wakes her husband up as well. May Allah have mercy on the husband who wakes up for tahajjud and then wakes his wife up as well. This notion of helping one another for righteousness, pushing one another to piety, and subhanallah, how many amongst us, we might not be as pious, as righteous as we are, had it not been that Allah blessed us with a spouse who is better than us, with a spouse who pushes us forward, with a spouse who reminds us to not do an evil deed and to strive for better deeds. And whoever has such a spouse should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then after that be appreciative of one's spouse. How important is it to have righteous spouses? In fact, simply by having a righteous spouse, your entire status changes. And of course, the example that comes to mind, even though it is the best of all examples, but still an example that is reflective for all of us. The example of our mothers, the wives of the Prophet wasallam. The mere fact that they are his wives sallallahu alayhi wasallam, makes them different from all other women. Simply because their companion 
and their husband is who he is, automatically they get something different. Ya nisa an nabiyyi lastunna ka ahadin min an nisa. O wives of the Prophet, you are not like any other wives. Simply by having a nikah contract and simply by being a life partner to the one whom Allah has chosen to be rahmatan lil alameen, you automatically have more responsibility. That's why Allah says in these series of verses, if you commit a sin, O wives of the Prophet, your punishment will be more. And if you do a good deed, your reward will be more as well. Now obviously, I'm not comparing any couple to the Prophet and his wives, but the concept, the concept of a wife taking on the responsibilities, the maqam, the status of the husband, and vice versa. This is something that we all experience even in this life. SubhanAllah, how many times that the success of the husband, the wife rises up with that success. The success of the wife, the husband rises up as a result of that success. SubhanAllah, how many times in the beginning of the marriage, an average couple comes together and then Allah blesses the one of them to keep on rising, rising, rising. They might become the CEO, the richest person, the president, and the wife or the spouse has to rise with that. And along with that, the responsibilities come. If this is something we see in this dunya, for this dunya, how much more so for the deen? How much more so for our religion so be careful brothers and sisters before you get married of who you are married to and when you are married examine your spouse for their religiosity because frankly usually speaking not always usually their religiosity is a reflection of your religiosity so just like the righteous spouse helps the righteous spouse towards Jannah, so too the wicked spouse, the evil spouse, can be a mechanism of leading to Jahannam. And this too we see from the Quran and from the seerah, from those who oppose the Prophet and from human history. One of the first revelations is about a couple who would help one another in evil. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab wa tab. Abu Lahab. The uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of his worst enemies, one of his staunchest opponents, Allah Azza wa Jal curses him. And then Allah says, وَمْرَأَتُهُ And his wife, حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبِ She will be carrying the sticks that are going to burn even more. It is said that his wife, and her name was Umm Jamil, the sister of Abu Sufyan, his wife Umm Jamil would eavesdrop in Meccan society, find out, an anecdote or something that could be used, twisted, deformed. She would rush to her husband and she would tell her husband ideas and plots and plans. Then the husband would do something to harm Islam. So Allah is saying, just like she would rush back to her husband carrying snippets and news, then in the fire of hell, she will be rushing to her husband carrying the fuel that is going to make Jahannam worse for them. Subhanallah, that's an evil couple. That is a couple that aided one another in evil, in fit in opposing Islam, well then, as they aided one another in this dunya, they shall aid one another in the hereafter, but not up there, down there. So we see this reality, brothers and sisters. Al-Khabithatul Al-Khabithin wa Tayyibatul Al-Tayyibin. Filthy are for filthy, and pure are for pure. And this is the general rule. But it is not always the case. There are plenty of exceptions. And sometimes those exceptions are worthy for us to think about and reflect. One of those exceptions, multiple times actually, Allah mentions some of these exceptions in the Quran. For example, the last verses of Surah Al-Tahreem. What does Allah say? ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Allah has given you a similitude, an example to those who reject Him. Look at the wives of Nuh and the wives of Lut. امْرَأَةَ نُوحٍ وَامْرَأَةَ لُوت Look at the wife of Nuh and Lut. كَانَتَ تَحْتَ عَبْدَيْنِ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا صَالِحِينَ The two of them, they were married to two very righteous servants of ours. They had the best husbands. They had the best husbands on earth. At that time, the Prophet Nuh was the best human on earth. At that time, the Prophet Lut was of the best humans on earth. But did that association in and of itself benefit them? فَخَانَتَاهُمَا they betrayed their husbands. They went against the teachings of their husbands. The piety of their husbands did not rub off on them. The beauty and the tayyib of their husbands did not impact them positively. And instead, فَخَانَتَاهُمَا So they betrayed them. How did they betray them? The wife of the Prophet Nuh, 
the wife of the Prophet Nuh, you know, at that time the Muslims were being persecuted in the time of Nuh alayhi salam. And the wife would hear of who converted because her husband's the Prophet. And she would tell her people, so and so converted, take care of him. She actually, her loyalty was to her people against Allah and His Messenger. And she would betray the secrets of Nuh alayhi salam by talking about who had embraced Islam, by giving that information and leaking that information. It is also said that when Nuh alayhi salam prepared for the flood and started building the ark, his wife doubted that this could ever happen. And his wife mocked this concept of there being a flood or whatnot. And so Allah Azza wa Jal did, did, mentioned her in the Quran, فَخَانَتَاهُمَا That the both of them betrayed. And as for Lut alayhi salam, we know what she did. The Quran tells us what she did. We know what she did. That even though she herself did not participate in the vulgarities of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah because her kith and kin were from there, because her culture and her society was from there. When the angels came, she sent the message to her people that there's handsome men here. You will like these men. Come and do with them as you please. So once again, she betrayed the secret of her husband. And this was enough that Allah Azza wa Jal says, O oh people, look at this example. O oh people, when the spouse betrays, when the spouse spouse does not live up to the ideals the both of them betrayed them and the both were told enter the fire of Jahannam with all those who are going to enter so we see here just because your husband is pious doesn't mean the wife is going to be pious and vice versa as well if the uh, if the husband is not pious doesn't mean the wife is going to be impious and Allah has given the example to those who believe of whom Imra'ata Fir'aun, the wife of Fir'aun, the worst human being to ever walk the face of this earth. We always think Hitler was the worst. Fir'aun was 10 times, 100 times worse than Hitler. Fir'aun was worse than the Hitler of our era. He was the Hitler times 10. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says his wife, she was not like him. His wife, of course, was Asiya. His wife, Asiya, would be tortured by her husband. She would be persecuted. And yet she never abandoned her faith. And she would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even as her husband is torturing her that, Oh Allah, allow me to have a house next to you in Jannah. قَالَ رَبِّ ابْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنِ Save me from Fir'aun and save me from the persecution of Fir'aun and make me of those who are righteous. So Allah Azza wa Jal gave her that dua. Just because her husband was the worst of the worst, she did not have an excuse in the eyes of Allah to become the worst of the worst. She still had responsibility and she still had the, the, the agency to say, I'm not going to do this. And because she opposed, she became the best of the best. So these examples show us that yes, while it is true, generally speaking, birds of a feather flock together, it's not always true. And if one spouse is not good or good, the other spouse can be good or not good as well. And that is something that the Quran is very clear about. Now, brothers and sisters, the point that comes here, and by the way, of course, right after this, um, Maryam is mentioned, Maryam was single, and this is kind of indicating, even if you're single, it should not be an excuse for Jannah and Jahannam. Whether you're married, whether you're single, your Jannah and Jahannam is not dependent on your spouse. True, your spouse can influence. True, the general rule is that your spouse does influence, but in the eyes of Allah, that is not an excuse. And even if you have the worst spouse, you can be the best, the best spouse, the best person in the eyes of Allah. And if you have the best spouse, well then, you might turn out to be the worst of the worst. So what is some of the lessons we can derive from all of these examples? Well, for those of you who are single, still to get married, looking to get married, I tell you bluntly, inshallah, like an older brother, that you need to think long and hard about the decision that will frankly, in all likelihood, be the single most important decision of your life. Far more important than your career. Far more important than which corporation you work for. Far more important than which city you live in shall be your choice of life partner. Who do you choose to invest your entire energies, your emotions, your love to potentially become the father or mother of your children? Who is that person who shall be your entire life partner in this world? And then inshallah ta'ala in the next, be careful brothers and sisters, young men and young women, do not be superficial. Do not look only at beauty or whatever it is that is number one on your minds. No, remember what our Prophet said. 
Look at the one who has religion and manners, deen and akhlaq. These are the two things because you can have one without the other. There are people who might have some deen, but they are really bad akhlaq. They haven't mastered the deen. There are some who might have good manners, but they're not praying. They're not good believers. You want to find somebody who has both deen and akhlaq. Look beyond the superficial. Look beyond the first few weeks or months. Brothers, sisters, do not be superficial about the decision that will frankly impact every single stage of your lives. Remember, when you are getting married, you are potentially impacted not potentially you are impacting your children your future children your future legacy this person you're marrying is going to be the mother of your children or the father of your children who is this person you better know this person and make the right decision pray istikhara pray istikhara ask Allah Azza wa to bless you and look at the deen and the akhlaq realize brothers and sisters that as I said this decision is going to impact you at every single level and potentially, potentially make your Jannah or Jahannam easier for you, one of the two. Wallahu al-musta'an. Think about that. If you're already married, if you're already married, then it is each spouse's responsibility, partially, not fully. You are partially responsible. Men, you are partially responsible. Women, you are partially responsible. Not fully, in the end of the day, ad adults are responsible to Allah directly. But partners, couples, they have a partial responsibility to positively influence their partner. And so if you're already married, and your two spiritualities are at different levels, well then, frankly, this is a problem. In a, uh, in a survey conducted by BYU University here in America, they surveyed hundreds of couples and they found that spiritual and faith-based compatibility was one of the top factors in preserving a marriage. If you're on the same wavelength spiritually, if you're on the same wavelength in a faith-based, in an iman and aqidah system, then actually that is one of the main factors that preserves your deen. Contrast to this, if you are in different wavelengths spiritually, if you are in different understandings of what religion and deen are, this is one of the biggest disasters and one of the most potential causes of divorce. You're not on the same wavelength. So, brothers and sisters, if you're not on the same wavelength religiously, you're married and your spouse is not on the same wavelength, do not take this as a trivial matter. Do not take this as something that you can or should ignore. Realize that your level of religion, your understanding of religion, it's like your entire operating system. All the programs of your life are going to be affected by it. The most important aspect to your existence is your deen. So your spouse should hopefully be on a similar wavelength and the both of you should be pushing each one forward. But unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. And all too often, one of the two partners changes even. And this is actually a very, very difficult reality that we have to face. Both of you marry, and perhaps at the first few years, the first decade, there's a similar wavelength. Then one of the two radically changes. Either goes up, that's the goal inshallah, or astaghfirullah goes down. And we have to deal with this as scholars, as shuyukh, as clerics. People come to us all the time that maybe the wife comes and says, Oh, I want to practice Islam more, but my husband does not pray. And I'm beginning to pray. Now he's getting angry. I'm wearing the hijab, whatnot. Or vice versa. And that is that, you know, the, the one of the spouses comes and says, You know, I married and we were like this together. Then now all of a sudden, major sins are happening. He's committing major sins. He's not praying. We used to pray. Now he's not praying. So they come to us expecting to solve these issues and of course there is no easy solution so some generic advice to couples who are not on the same wavelength first and foremost realize if you have changed if you're the one and if you're listening to the khutbah then inshallah most likely if you have changed you've risen up you've become a more practicing Muslim so if you have changed then realize that it is your responsibility to be super gentle. Because in the end of the day, the partner you married is still the same. You might have had a religious rediscovery. You might have had an experience that causes you to become closer to Allah, love the messenger more, good for you. But realize, your partner whom you've been with for 5, 10, 15 years, perhaps she hasn't had that. So the fact that you have moved upwards and onwards means there's more responsibility on you to be gentle in how you push your spouse to get to the same level as you. 
Also realize a very important point of Islamic theology. Just because you love someone doesn't mean you can guide someone. Innaka la tahdi man ahbabta. Allah says to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "You cannot guide those whom you love. Guidance is from Allah. Walakin Allah yahdi man yasha. Just because you love somebody, just because that person is your life partner and you have become religious, don't think the other person will automatically follow. We see this in Nuh and Lut. They love their wives. They love them. It wasn't enough to guide their wives. Also realize, dear partners, dear spouses, generally speaking, long lectures and harsh rhetoric is not the best way to move your partner to become more spiritual. Generally speaking, giving threats and being nasty and mean and angry is not the best way to gain the hearts of anyone, much less the hearts of your spouse and your life partner. Realize you might have to work for the long run by demonstrating the positive impact of religion on your life. Show them you are better for the deen. Show them you are more mature, more loving, more compassionate. Demonstrate through your actions the beauty of being more religious, not through your harshness and tongue, not through threats and whatever you do. Brothers and sisters, husbands in particular, whatever you do, do not use the D word to try to make your wives a better person. The D word here is divorce. You're not going to threaten your wife to be a better Muslima by threatening to divorce her, even if, by the way, even if a divorce must take place, threatening to divorce so that she becomes a better Muslimah, that's not how you want real Islam to come. Real Islam has to come from love of Allah and His Messenger. Real Islam has to come from within. Simply threatening and being harsh is not the way to increase love and Iman. And again, I say this, maybe the relationship is so bad that divorce is the only option. If that is the case, then threatening to divorce is not the way. Do it the way the Prophet commanded us to do it, with dignity, with kindness, with compassion. And don't expect that when you're harsh and mean and nasty, your partner all of a sudden is going to become the better Muslim or Muslimah. No, that's not the tactic to use. Also, brothers and sisters, choose your battles wisely. If you, mashallah, have grown spiritually and you are now doing things you didn't choose to do, don't expect your partner partner to go all that way up with you. Begin with the basics. Begin with love of Allah. Begin with love of the Prophet ﷺ. Begin with trying to avoid the major sins. Avoid that which are more trivial. Concentrate on the bigger battles. And also, a lot of times, a lot of friction comes between couples based on understandings of which religious scholar to follow, which madhab, which shaykh to take advice from. As long as the scholars you're looking up to are mainstream and within the purview of mainstream Islam, don't make this to be an issue of animosity. Discussion should be civil. As I've said in my lectures about sectarianism, if your spouse follows another preacher, another shaykh of the mainstream, I'm not talking about the fringe, of the mainstream of the ummah, then this is not something that should cause you so much distress. Are they not praying five times? a day? Are they not fasting the month of Ramadan? Are they not avoiding the major sins? Alhamdulillah. Then as for which shaykh the person is listening to, this is much more easy to manage and don't make this an issue of such animosity or hatred. Look at the broader pictures. See the positives and negatives. And most importantly, perhaps the best way to influence your partner is simply through the language of love the language of compassion, the language of spending quality time, not by lecturing, not by, you know, quoting verdicts and fatwas, simply by being a better version of who you were a year or two ago, being the best version you can be, and your partner sees how you have changed because of religion. And the last point we'll mention, never ever forget the power of dua. Never underestimate the power of dua. Our hearts are between the fingers of Allah. He changes as however He wishes. We make dua to Allah. Allah to make our hearts firm and we make dua to Allah to bless our partners and spouses and in light of all of this talk of marriage and whatnot tomorrow inshallah ta'ala we're going to be having a full day conference primarily meant for the singles from Dhuhr until Maghrib about the aspects of choosing the right spouse from Maghrib to Isha all of the uh, communities invited practical advice about uh, marriage and then after Isha uh, for the matrimonial section inshallah because we
we believe that as a community center, especially in a non-Muslim land, it is our responsibility to take charge of this, of this matter and to be uh, someone who can guide or to be an entity that can guide those that are single about the best way to get married, those that are married about the best way to improve their marriage, and those that want to get married to facilitate finding partners from within the community that will all be taking place tomorrow. Barakallahi wa rakum fuqur'an al-azim wa naf'ani wa yaakum bima fihim la'ati wa dhikr al-hakim aqulu ma tasma'oon wa astaghfirullah al-azim li wa lakum wa li sa'il muslimin bi kulli dhamin fa astaghfiru innahu wa al-ghafur al-rahim Astaghfirullah Astaghfirullah Alhamdulillah al-wahid al-ahad al-samad al-lazhi lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufuan ahad wa ba'du Dear Muslims, we are all aware of the painful loss of one of the iconic scholars of our ummah, dare I say, the iconic scholar of our time frame, and that is Sheikh Yusuf al Qaradawi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on his soul and grant him firdos. Brothers and sisters, the loss of a scholar is always a time of reflection, is always a time of deep introspection. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah does not take knowledge away simply by snatching it out of the chests of people. Allah does not take knowledge away simply by snatching it out of the chests of people. Rather, He takes knowledge away by the death of ulama, by the death of scholars. This is how knowledge and scholarship is taken away, such that when scholarship is taken away, there are no scholars that are legitimate. So, the Prophet ﷺ said, the people will take ignoramuses to be their rulers. And so they're going to cause themselves to go astray and they're going to cause others to go astray as well. When scholars leave this earth, when scholars move on, that is when we most appreciate them. That is when we realize we should have appreciated them more when they were here. But even if the scholars live, have moved on, their legacies remain. Their legacies are there. I remind all of us that our Prophet ﷺ told us that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets respect the ulama of this world take advantage of them make dua for them and i have a small anecdote i wanted to share about uh, sheikh yusuf al-qardawi that demonstrates what real scholarship does despite the disagreements no doubt being who he was and being such a uh, iconic mover and shaker you cannot accomplish this global uh, uh, movement without getting criticism and without having people people disagree with you and he wrote his most famous book al-halal wal haram fil islam which is an amazing book and allah has blessed it with an amazing acceptance. No other book of modern fiqh has been given more acceptance than this book, and this is well known. And I have explained why in my lecture. This book was published back in the 60s, 70s. It began spreading across the world. Eventually, it made its, made, it made its way to the land of Arabia, where the fatwas of the local ulama were sometimes different than this book. And the great scholar of Arabia at the time, the Mufti, Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, who is his own great alim, mujtahid, a great person of knowledge, we respect and admire him, he read the book. He had the book read to him. And he wrote a letter to Sheikh Qardawi, which is preserved. And this is back in the early 80s. And he said, Allah has blessed you with this book. This book is doing an amazing job. However, I have eight points of disagreement. And because of these points of disagreement, you know, I, I want you to think about this. I don't want this book to be spread in my country right now because these are eight issues that I strongly disagree. And he listed them one after the other. And he said to the Shaykh, please look into them. And if you can change your mind, I'd appreciate it. Shaykh Qardawi wrote back, a very beautiful letter. Again, all of this is preserved. And he said, My dear esteemed Mufti, Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, if people would change their fiqhi opinions for other people, I would be the first to change my opinions out of my respect to you. I respect you so much that if people changed opinions out of respect, I will be the first to change my opinions because of my respect for you. But people of knowledge, don't change opinions based upon other people. This is what their ijtihad has reached them to. And Shaykh Qardawi said, it is the sunnah of Allah that within the scholarly community, you will find differences of opinion. From the time of the Sahaba, there were differences. So we're not going to solve these differences simply by eliminating them. These are the positions I have come to. If I am right, I hope Allah will reward me double. If I'm wrong, I still expect Allah to reward me once for a sincere attempt. And Jazakumullahu khairan. Sheikh Ibn Baz was so impressed with this letter and the adab of this letter. He had never met Sheikh Qardawi. He wrote him an invitation. You are invited to Hajj. 
Hajj to come and meet me. A royal Hajj, you weren't invited to come and Hajj. And the two of them then interacted together and they established a friendship together. And Sheikh Qardawi says, I was shocked that even though the Sheikh said, I don't, I don't like these eight opinions, when I visited the kingdom, lo and behold, my book was allowed to be sold because the Mufti then allowed the book, even though he didn't agree with those opinions. This is what real ilm does. It teaches you tolerance. I don't have to agree. I don't have to necessarily see eye to eye, but this is a great alim. He has an opinion, live and let live. And I say to all of us here, do not take other religious Muslims as your enemies. Do not take folks that are lowering their head to Allah, praying five times a day, having a slightly different belief, slightly different fiqh than you. Don't take them as enemies. Even from the time of the Sahaba, there was some diversity. So keep that spirit alive. You choose the ulama you most like you choose the scholars you are resonating with most the ones whom you think know the most and fear Allah the most and then follow them your brother your spouse your cousin your best friend chooses another group of scholars as long as they're within the mainstream and again what is the mainstream I have given a whole bunch of khutbas last two months about this as long as they're within the mainstream of the ummah live and let live do not allow animosity to be so much that you cannot tolerate a difference of opinion learn from the spirit of Sheikh Qardawi and Sheikh bin Baz despite the fact that they did not see eye to eye on so many issues they remained utmost firmly brothers in Islam and when Sheikh bin Baz passed away I was actually in Saudi at the time Sheikh Qardawi flew in immediately on the same day and he was in the first line to pray Janazah over Sheikh bin Baz Allah this is what real scholarship does the love of Islam is broader than one firqa one maslak one madhab the love of Allah and his messenger transcends so many different movements so learn from those who want to unify the ummah bring the ummah together and avoid those who are sectarian and preaching narrow-mindedness what we have in common with so many other mainstream groups is far more than what those differences are may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all the scholars to unite the ummah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep our hearts alive with love of Allah and love of the messenger Allahumma inni da'in fa amminu Allahumma la ta'ala fi hadhi jawmi dhamban illa ghafarta ولا هما إلا فرجت ولا دينا إلا قضيت ولا مريضا إلا شفيت ولا عسيرا إلا يسرت اللهم اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم من أرادنا أو أراد الإسلام والمسلمين بالسوء فاشغله بنفسه واجعل تدميره في تدبيره يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكة قدسه وثلث بكم أيها المؤمنون من جنه وإنسه فقال عز من قال عليما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك رسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروا يزد لكم ولا ذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله استو straight new rose leave no gaps in the line الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين 
إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين ضرب الله مثلا للذين كفروا امرأة نوح وامرأة لوط كانتا تحت عبدين من عبادنا صالحين فخانتاهما فلم يغنيا عنهما من الله شيئا وقيل ادخلا النار مع الداخلين وضرب الله مثلا للذين آمنوا امرأة فرعون إذ قالت رب ابن لي عندك بيتا في الجنة ونجني من فرعون وعمله ونجني من القوم الظالمين ومريم ابنة عمران التي أحصنت فرجها فنفخنا فيه من روحنا وصدقت بكلمات ربها وكتبه وكانت من القانتين الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين تبت يدا أبي لهب وتب ما أغنى عنه ماله وما كسب سيصلى نارا ذات لهب وامرأته حمالة الحطب في جيدها حبل من مسد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله